Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming. We know that we're last, and so you're tired and you want to go home, and it's the second day. So thanks for staying with us. Um, we are, our presentation, obviously, you know, is about phenomena, um, and I'm going to get us started with a little bit of work for you. So, oh, and I'm Whitley Troutman. And I'm Erin Nunley. Yeah. Okay, so to start this, we're going to get you um, in the inquiry kind of process um, by presenting you with a phenomena. So we have two images on the left side of the screen, and you should have post-its at the end of your table if you don't mind to share those. Um, just whatever questions you have, there's really no bad question. Um, there's no right or wrong question. So whatever questions you have, we do ask that every question is written on a separate post-it. So if you have five questions, you have five post-its. So take a minute to do that, and then we will um, we'll talk to you about what we're going to do with those questions. Just as many post-its as you can come up with questions for, because there's one question per post-it. And we have more if you need yes. some. Okay, you can keep working on those. Um, I'm gonna display the next slide, and Ms. Nunley is gonna read it in case it's hard to see in the back. So over here on the left, this lady is saying, did you hear these crafty natives are catching rats, cutting off their tails, and then releasing them so they will breed more rats with precious little tails. Maybe they are more cunning and energetic than we thought. And then the man over here says, don't mistake trickiness and desperation for intelligence or initiative. These people are lazy and only think of immediate profit. They have no sense of the long term like children. They live in the moment. And then the final guy says, hmm, yes. And it might be the Chinese who are telling them what to do. So if that made you have any new questions or maybe you want to clarify a previous question, feel free to make any um, more post-its that you need. We'll do like one or two more minutes. All right, so we need one brave person to share one of their questions, and I'm going to walk to you because you get to talk in this fun microphone. We need to share our questions now. Who would like to start? Anybody? Okay, I will come to you. Mine was, I wondered if it was a mouse or a rat. So I'm going to take her question and put it up here. Normally the students would come up and do that, but we're going to let y'all sit in your seats today. All right, does, so does somebody have a different question they would like to say? Um, are the rats in a nest? Okay, so do you think that are the rats in a nest go with her question of, I wonder if it's a rat or a mouse? So we're going to try to categorize these. 
So do you think these questions are similar? Nope, so we'll put it on a different post-it. Or white post-it. <laughs> Have these rats had to adapt because of human impact? Does it go on either one of those, or should we put it on a new one? New one? All right. Grab that. I think she had one right, right there. Is there more than one mom? Because there are a lot of rats. Ah. Same of any of these? Or a different one? Over here? Okay. So then we're eventually we're going to have you start thinking of what will we call the category. We're not going to get to there just yet. Does somebody have a different question? Or maybe one that relates to one that you've already heard. Why would anyone want more rats? It's a good question. Where would this one go? New one? Okay. Are they a pest control company was her question. So we're going to put it up here with this one. So what category could we name this paper over here? Are they a pest control company and why would anyone want more rats? What kind of category could we say that those fall into? Eradication? Eradication? All right, so if you want to get another question, I'll write that. All right, so and another way that we do this in our classroom is once we start to get these questions grouped, uh, we'll say anyone who has a question, any of your post-its that are questions similar to ones that we have up there, you can go ahead and put it up there yourself. And then we would read through them aloud to the class and let them start grouping kind of like we just did there. So if you have any post-its that are similar to some that you've heard read aloud, uh, feel free to go post those now. And then we'll make, start making some more categories. I'll yep. go over here. What's that one? Why are they on the steps? Let's see. A location? We can also split the big piece of white paper. So I'll add location over here. So we have tails and location here, eradication over there. Oh, okay. Let's see. Do y'all see a category developing over here? So this one we're going to name identification. And over here, what category have y'all found? All right, so we are trying to kind of fast track this to get through everything. So just kind of explaining instead of doing the rest of it, what we do with this is typically at the beginning of a new unit, um, we'll display some sort of phenomena similar to the rat stuff that you just saw. Uh, and we'll let the kids do this. And if they need more um, post-its or if they are doing it on the whiteboard, they can just draw lines in between them. Um, but eventually we'll let them, or sometimes it's teacher supported, start to circle post-its together that are all similar in one sort of way um, and put a, a heading to them. And so then, like and these two right here, they're the very same question. We oh would yeah. start labeling stuff on top of them. 
Yeah. Just kind of grouping them all together. So, and this would lead us into our storyline concepts um, with science that we do. Some of our, we, it would help us pick out tasks for reading. Um, it would just help us really get a guide and the, and the students have that ownership um, of their learning because when they look at this, this is what they question. And honestly, a lot of the times it does directly relate to science standards that we know that we need to cover in that upcoming quarter. Um, math we can relate it to, social studies, and obviously ELA. So this is just a, a fast track way to do it. Um, this one I broke into two different parts. So after we did this first round, I would show a little bit more um, information. And this is one I've actually done in my class, but this is um, a little bit of a summary of what was going on uh, without telling too much. So Ms. Nunley, um, are you reading this one? Or we said they could. I'm gonna read it, okay. So it says, Paul Dalmer was appointed Governor General of French Indochina in 1897. Immediately, Dalmer set about outfitting Indochina, and especially Hanoi, the capital, with modern infrastructure benefiting property of France. It turns out that when Dalmer's colonial government laid more than nine miles of sewage pipe beneath Hanoi, it inadvertently created nine miles of cool, dark rodent paradise where the pests could breed without fear of predators. And when they got hungry, the rats had direct access to the city's ritziest real estate via a subterranean superhighway. Under the streets of French Hanoi, rats multiplied exponentially and then skittered to the surface. As a, solu a solution was devised, Vietnamese rat hunters hired by the colonial government would descend into the sewers to hunt the rats down and be paid for each one eliminated. So the kids would get really interested now because they, they have more than just rat tails or, you know, a rat infestation. So they have a little bit more direction to ask more questions. So we won't necessarily do that because we do want to fast track it, but we would let them have more post-its. Sometimes we color code it, other times we don't. Um, and they would ask more questions, and we would kind of go through the same thing that we just did, um, adding to these topics, maybe making them a little bit more specific, or making, making new topics altogether, just depending on what direction they go with those questions. This is me too. Okay. And so this was actually a, a graphic novel that was created based on this event, um, The Great Hanoi Rat Hunt. And we used it, it didn't necessarily go much along with our um, science standards or math standards. I mean, we could stretch relate it, but what we did is we were trying to treat, teach critical thinking. And so we wanted them to, to think outside of the box and to think of you know, effects from one potential solution and how it leads to other things. And so this was called the COBRA effect. Um, so the COBRA effect is when a solution to a problem actually makes the problem worse. So. In the early 20th century, there was a huge rat problem that was causing health concerns. And to address the problem, people, the general public, was encouraged to kill rats. That was their job. And they were rewarded for doing that. If they brought back their tails to prove that they had killed them, they would get paid. So as a result, these tailless rats were sighted throughout the city. So that what happened was people had started illegally breeding rats. Um, that was against the law because they were trying to get rid of them. But people were illegally breeding them um, for their tails. And then tailless rats, they started adapting, um, started surfacing. So they weren't actually killing the rats. They were just chopping off their tails and letting them breed more. So um, we just used that one really for fun to really get them into it because kids are like, ooh, rats, gross, you know. And so, but we taught a, a really critical thinking skill with this one. Okay, so, oh, that didn't show up the way I wanted it to, but that's good. Uh, my name is Whitley Troutman. I'm a self-contained fifth grade teacher at Overall Creek Elementary in Murfreesboro City Schools. We were designated as um, a STEM school in, by TSIN in 2018. Um, I'm currently teaching in my ninth year um, with experience in third and fifth grade. And I am Erin Nunley. This is my 20th year teaching, and I currently teach sixth grade. I've taught a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and we are currently working on our redesignation for next year, so we're working on that process right now. So the goals of our lesson, our, sorry, our presentation today, leave with a solid understanding of the purpose, importance, and practicality of incorporating phenomenon in the classroom, 
to help give you some strategies so you can implement it in your own classroom and engage in inquiry-based learning given real-world phenomenon, which you've already kind of experienced. So I want you to take a moment and just reflect over these two quotes. Can y'all see them in the back? I love the theme of this year's TSIN conference, Sparking Curiosity. We've been to several different presentations. We've heard keynote speakers, and all of them have talked about curiosity, questioning how we need to get our students involved in inquiry. And that's exactly what phenomenon is. So in STA, um, the National Science Teaching Association, this is what they say about phenomenon. So according to the next gen science standards, phenomenon in our science classrooms help, they're just observable things that we do. It helps get the children asking questions. Um, there are some examples of some questions that they say that we can use as guiding questions. That last one, do people really behave differently during a full moon? It's just a way to question, a way to have inquiry to get our students to have some buy-in. And I think of when I was first in school and we, I was taught with a teacher sitting at a desk with one of those overhead projectors. Remember those visa visa markers? Some of you probably don't know what I'm talking about. And I would sit there and take notes. I would be given a list of vocabulary words that I had to define. I had to learn what those words meant. And so it's really flipping what we're doing. We're not sitting there giving them the content before they get to practice it. They are getting to explore the content on their own. They're having immediate buy-in. Our engagement has improved. And this is all, this is the why of why, why we're doing the phenomenon. The last couple of sentences, phenomena should be the foundation of our science teaching, a springboard for curiosity. There's that word again. We want our students to be curious. We want them to want to come back to school and continue. When she did the rat stuff, it took a couple days to do it. It wasn't one lesson. So they were excited about it. They wanted to come back. They wanted to figure out why the, what's the big deal with all these rats? Um, wonderful question. A place for amazement. So we asked what, some of our students what they thought about phenomenon. Um, Savannah said, phenomenon helps me get interested in what we're learning and understand what we're going to be investigating. Essen said, I like using phenomena because it helps me understand science better and help me adapt my thinking. And I asked her, what do you mean adapt your thinking? She said, when I used to be in a science classroom, I felt that I didn't get to really think on my own. I was thinking like the teacher wanted me to think. And she felt that she was able to change her thinking. So if we had continued with this, your initial question, you might have had a different question. And it's okay. We didn't point out any of your post-its and said, well, this is what this person said. Does that even make sense? We don't do that in our classrooms either. And so they can change their thinking, and it can be something completely different from what they've started with. They're more comfortable. They don't have to share out loud. And then Stephanie said, the observations allow us to process what we learn and work it out without being given the answer. And that's a key takeaway we want you to have is we don't give them the answers. I know from my class, I have, they have to hold up their hand and promise they're not going to go home and Google because it's going to ruin it. And they don't tell me, if they do it, they don't tell me that they're doing it. And so, because I know that would make me so sad. And that's a big thing. We don't give them the answers. We want them to discover this on their own. We want them to learn science, or we've also used it in other subjects. Mainly, we use it in science. We want them to have that discovery and that inquiry. And I would like to add something really quickly before I get started on another example. Um, we are currently, in obviously, quarter four, and we're working on, you know, kind of before, you know, testing, we had some weeks that we could review, but we wanted to keep them engaged. Uh, they could definitely kill and drill at that point and then just fail you for testing. So obviously, we were trying to mix it up and do some fun stuff. And so our current, um, I guess, phenomena was the, the sinking of the Titanic. And so we, we introduced them to that right in the beginning. We started it with an argumentation um, trial, which is what Aaron and myself presented on last year here. Um, but we said that there was a conspiracy, there's several conspiracy theories, but there's one that it wasn't really the Titanic that sank, that it was its sister ship, the Olympic, 
and it was all an insurance fraud. So we started with that, and the kids, I mean, they'd maybe watch the Titanic movie, um, some of them, a handful of them, but other than that, they didn't have much background knowledge on this um, in fifth grade, and so, but they were so interested, and I had a kid who was literally sick, like she had vomited that morning at home, and her mom's dojoing me, like she wants to come to school because she wants to know, was it really the Titanic? And I was like, and I wouldn't tell her. I mean, obviously, I was like, please don't send her to school if she's, if she's truly sick. I promise we'll catch her up. But they're just, they love it. And, and we're building a boat right now. Our engineering problem is we're, they're making a lifeboat because, you know, there weren't, en- weren't enough lifeboats on the Titanic. So they're making a lifeboat to float their teacher. And it can only be made of duct tape and cardboard. So, and I'm going to actually get in our creek or Overall Creek because Overall Creek runs behind our school. And I'm actually going to get in our our creek tomorrow and test it out. Um, so they're so excited. I had um, one that's going out for a wedding, going out of town, and she's going to miss, she was going to miss our boat float at 9 o'clock in the morning. And her mom's like, well, our flight's at 10.55. I think I could pick her up at 9.30. Like, the kids want to come to school. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, oh, another example we've done this year um, in fifth grade was we introduced them to this, the idea of this peppered moth. Um, it's just a, a species of moth. And we, this was the first thing that we displayed, and so they have these working science notebooks, and we let them just write their questions and kind of do similar to what we did there, but we did it in their journal. They started to come up with topics and uh, write their topics on their tables and then make connections and all kinds of stuff. So this was the first chart. We, we display tons of stuff. Phenomena isn't one It's not a picture. It's not just one thing. It's not just a video. It can be um, a real-world event going on. It could be news headlines. It could be um, YouTube videos. It could be charts. It can be anything. So we displayed this one first, and we kind of had them go through a similar process to what you just went through. And then we displayed another table and chart. Um, Now it's starting to show you that there's some changes. over time, over a span of you know eight years, that one population goes up while one goes down. So they're starting to kind of direct their questions a little bit more. Oh my gosh, I keep hitting that. And then there's a timeline where you can see this dates back to 1850. And as recently as 2000, you can see that there kind of was a full circle here. It started with mostly speckled um, dark form of peppered moths being rare. It goes to, during the 1900s, it goes to Um, mostly dark peppered moths visible and speckled was rare, so there's a flip there. But then you see, you know, many years later, it goes back to the way it began. So then we start, they start asking why. This was their biggest, well, why? Why did you originally see this one type of moth? um, And then, you know, 50-ish years later, you see another type. um, And then it does full circle. What caused that? What was the reason? And we actually related this. There's a simulator. I think it's a FET simulator, too, that you can kind of change the dates and actually observe these moths in the trees and stuff like that. So they started asking just why, 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 so sparking that curiosity. Um, the pictures on the left, we would show them. Uh, at the end of this unit, this lasted us for a good, I think, week or so. Um, they were given this text. Like Aaron said earlier, we don't tell them the answer. We never give them the answer, even in the end. Like, we will finally give them something where they can find that answer, but we're not going <laughs> to. They're like, so it was this all along, and recently the Titanic. It was the Titanic all along. Well, I, I never gave them anything to think that. Even in the trial, I let the side that had the best evidence win, not the side that actually was right or wrong. So uh, it tells you um, that, I won't read it for you, but essentially what happened was during industrialization, factory smog and all kinds of pollution in the air made things kind of soot-colored, dark. And so that 1900 time frame was during that time period in the world. And so the birds and other predators as that would be feeding on these moths. Well, usually they could spot those dark moths because they would stand out on these light colored trees and things like that, light colored leaves. So they would eat the dark moths. Um, so therefore you would observe more peppered moths. Um, but then during industrialization that flipped, everything was dark and sooty. So um, those light ones showed up better. They were more eaten. And then it went back after kind of that era ended. So we talked about science concepts, such as how um, there are adaptations of species and how some of those adaptations allow them to um, grow and thrive and reproduce, and some don't. Um, How there are variations in species, um, and there can be mixtures within those. 
So it just related to a lot of things. So we did science with it. We did uh, social studies with it, with the industrialization, because that's part of fifth grade social studies. So they just loved it. I mean, it's something as dumb as moths. They were really interested in. I mean, they really were. Another one that we did um, was dry ice. This one was fun because we could actually have that in our classroom. So they came in one morning and we just had a big tub of dry ice sitting there. And most of them didn't know what that was. They've had not really had experience with that. But they just saw this what looked to be like smoke coming off of it because obviously it was starting to thaw. Um, but then they could see the solid. I told them not to touch it, and they were like, why? I was like, well, actually do it, and then tell me why not. And so they didn't, but they touched it. They started to see some condensation on the outside of the containers, so they could see that there was some temperature change going on there. We related it to, later on to different um, phase changes. We don't really get into just solid, liquid, or gas in fifth grade. That's more of a third grade, but we do get into reversible and irreversible changes. So we could talk about, you know, what happened here when matter seems to disappear, when it appears to disappear. Did it actually disappear? Did it change forms? That sort of thing. So we did some measurements um, in the beginning and in the end, and they actually saw that it eventually just kind of disappeared. But did it really? So we got into that whole conversation. And then I swear I went like a week without letting them investigate it at all. And we went through some science labs with changing states of matter and stuff like that and changing reversible versus irreversible things. And at the very end, um, we kind of, I gave, I gave them a little snippet of a text that told them what happened. And they're like, oh, that makes sense. That's why you didn't tell us, because we had to learn that some changes are um, reversible and some aren't. They're just like, they're super nerdy with these things, but they love it. So those were a couple of my examples. And now Miss Nunley has some to talk about. And they remember it more when they're discovering it on their own. So one of the most common questions we get are, where do you find your phenomena? We're gonna get into that in a little bit, but this phenomena I found, the lake effect snow, it was in November of last year, and I was doing some schoolwork and I had the news on, and I heard somebody being interviewed saying it was a once in a generation storm. I was like, wait, what? What are they talking about? Well, it was the mayor of Buffalo, New York, and he was talking about how they had had 30 plus inches of snow. That's a lot of snow. I'm from Georgia. We did not get that kind of snow. So I started listening, and they were talking about how it was called lake effect. So immediately I started Googling what is lake effect snow because I did not know. Um, one thing I do want to add is we know our standards, and so anytime we hear something that relates to anything we have to teach, that's when we're, ooh, that's going to be a good phenomenon for our class. So lake effects snow, for those that don't know, when the jet stream, sixth grade standard, dips down and we get that cold Canadian air, the lakes, let's see if the laser, oh, it works on here. The lakes are warmer. And so that warm air, it is evaporating and it condenses and it dumps on the leeward side of that lake, which is another sixth grade standard, onto, into Buffalo. So that's why it is, you see more snowfall in here, in these areas, and you don't see it maybe over here in Rochester. So I put my pictures, I had about 10 to 12 pictures that I put on vertical boards. Um, there was a session earlier on the vertical boards by um, Peter, I don't know how to say his last name, so we're just gonna go with it, but it's building thinking classrooms in math. I use them in science as well, and actually multiple subjects. So if you haven't read that book, you need to check it out. Um, but I put these pictures on the vertical boards around the room. We had actual pictures. Some of you might remember this one. It was a restaurant that froze over in Buffalo. And then I had some images of satellites and some radar images just from um, the Weather Channel that I had snipped. And I had the students go around and do a notice and wonder. They were writing questions. They were asking questions of what other people had written. They were trying to answer some of the questions, but really what I wanted them to notice is that this was happening near the water. Um, and here are some of the questions they came up with. They did start to notice the weather. Some of them asked, or the color, sorry, I read that bad weather. Um, some of them did talk about the um, water. I thought I had one of those up there, maybe not. Oh yeah, they did. What are these lakes and, wh and where are they? Um, they noticed that there was bad weather. Then on some of the papers, there were also different dates. So this happened in November 2023, 2022. 
it, November 2023 hasn't happened yet. Yeah. For those that don't know, <laughs> um, it was November 2022. Well, it also happened, one of these images was 1977. It's the one in the middle. Um, we also had some from, I think it was 2004. So this keeps happening, and it's happening in Buffalo. Why is it happening? I never gave them the title Lake Effect Snow. I just said, what causes a once-in-a-generation storm? So that's what they were researching. And I actually waited till January because I was afraid some of them may have seen at least that one image on the news because I know that it was on our local news. And I didn't want them to know what it was. So I didn't give them the lake effect. But I did have them make a claim that first day. So they had to write down why there was a once-in-a-generation storm. Why is this happening? They had claim, res reason, and evidence. Then the next day, um, I wanted to do a science experiment, but I couldn't get liquid hydrogen in my classroom. It's really hot. It could burn us, so I wasn't allowed to do that. It would have been really cool, though. Um, and I didn't show them the title of this, but I had a snippet. It was a meteorologist that had gone to a local college in Buffalo, and it, the scientist did an experiment with liquid hydrogen and water. And so I showed that to them, and sure enough, it makes snow. It's a really cool video. So then they made another claim. I was hoping they would connect the water. Um, and they know all their prior knowledge from third grade. They do a lot of weather in third grade, so a lot of them were tying that in. And then um, another day I gave them um, the text. So it took us maybe three or four days to do this. And then finally there was another video from Buffalo and it was um, a teacher, I believe, and she was explaining the lake effect snow. So that was a lot of fun and they learned a lot of their weather standards through that phenomenon. And another one that I do every year that the students love are ocean currents. Um, I didn't learn about ocean currents when I was in school, and I had to teach ocean currents, and there's a lot that goes along with ocean currents. So I split the class in half. Half of them had to research rubber ducks, and the other half had to research Nike tennis shoes. And they were given coordinates, and they had to figure out how did these rubber ducks and tennis shoes get all over the world. Um, and they were, they were given a map, and they had to do, look at the latitude and longitude, and they had to graph it. Basically, what happened, there are container ships that they're shipping things all over the world, and when they get caught in storms, all this stuff falls um, into the ocean. The ocean currents pick them up, and they scatter them in different places. And I think this image has some of the stuff that they were able to look at. They had to figure out how it got there and why it got there. I also found on YouTube there's a 10 most bizarre things you, that have washed up on our beaches, and there's an image of Doritos that they were in a container ship and it fell and there were all these Dorito packages. There was a Lego man, um, a giant Lego man, probably my size, maybe bigger, I don't know. Um, so yeah, they had immediate buy into that and it helped teach my ocean current standards that usually it's not a lot of fun, it's hard. When I first started teaching these science standards, I was like, oh my goodness, how am I going to teach this to them? They love it. And now every year this is what we go towards, and they're actually learning a lot with it. Um, I believe Ms. Trotman already mentioned this. We just look anywhere and everywhere. So we did supply chain. Last year when there was issues with the supply chain, we talked about the energy crisis. So this was just a little picture we took from, you know, a news story. What's going on with the supply chain? They started asking questions. Um, teach ancient civilizations, ancient Egypt. How did they build the pyramids? What were they doing? And then just graphs. I love working with graphs. There's so much with graphs. They have to know how to read them anyway. So that's another good way to um, add phenomena into your classroom. All right, so if you don't mind going ahead and um, going to our Padlet, this gives you some examples there is a password, it's T-S-I-N, all lowercase. And we also linked some um, typical places that will start looking for phenomena, um, Science Daily, things like that. There's no, like, there's no right or wrong place to look, but we thought that you may be wondering where you could kind of springboard some ideas. So we did make a whole column of generators that you could use to try to find some stuff, but 
watch the news, um, subscribe to people's podcasts and things like that, follow people on Twitter, mm -hmm. and you can find a lot of stuff there too. Um, or documentaries. I like to watch documentaries. My children call me old, but I like watching documentaries, and I learn a lot. There's a curiosity channel now. Um, in fact, the guest speaker from last year, the keynote speaker, he's on that channel a lot. Kareem, Kareem maybe. Mm -hmm. um, the Smithsonian Channel, there's all kind of things. I was watching Aerial America with California, and it talked about Monterey Bay and the bioluminescence and how it was the most diverse area. And I said, why is it diverse? So I started figuring out why is Monterey Bay so diverse. So this has where to find some phenomenon and just some examples that we use. And do you have any questions? Because it's almost time. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I want to know what, how you came up with the tying the rubber duck and the Nike shipment because I've taught both of those lessons, but in, separately. So that was brilliant that you tied them together and then separated. That was that a lesson you created or? It was. I had found both of them separate, and I like to do argumentation in the classroom, and so I used it as an argumentation piece where they had to figure out who, they actually worked in a full group, and they had to figure out why the rubber ducks were there or the Nike shoes, and then they had to present it to each other, and I used it with argumentation. It's the first time I'd ever done it that way, and I really liked it. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, we had to for online. Oh. That's why. <laughs> How would you adapt this for K2 classrooms? That's a good question. Yeah, it is. Um, I can say that every grade level in our school uses phenomena um, in storylines. Uh, I don't know specific examples of ones they've done, but they Cherry do the exact Coates. same. Yes, and Cherry is in the back. She's our, our academic, academic coach. coach and she plans she with all of them, so yeah. she can help. Okay, um, so like for example, first grade, we did one, Can You Grow a Sock? And they took the kids and they had secretly put um, seeds outside their classroom door and they gave every kid go. one sock to put on and then they went and planted the socks in those little plastic bag. And so then they, the phenomenon was, well, how did the plant get on the sock? So we use it. K2, it's again just thinking about like where are those things in the real world, those things that make you ask questions. And they, they do their questions on post-its as well, right, Ms. Ross? Yeah. And then sometimes they do them orally. The teacher orally at first, mm -hmm. especially at the beginning of the year, but then they let them just go and move to post-its. I think the most important thing is just making sure you know your standards so that way when you are out in the world and you've got your curiosity going, it really helps you. Away. I think I've, sorry, I already put mine away. I've been guilty of that in the past when they're really struggling or just asking really good questions. You just want to hop in and save them. And you want to, you're excited too, but you have to be careful to not give that away because then the thinking's gone. Um, but if they don't have the answer for days or weeks, then they're dying to figure it out. And it just makes the buy in more um, special to them. So, which is why it's really important to flip are teaching and make sure we're starting with this wonderment that they're able to discover on their own and use their curiosity without giving it to them because then they're done. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? We just really like this quote we put at the end, half of science is asking the right questions. Exactly. So. All right, there is a quick survey. I know y'all are tired if you don't mind filling it out because we would like to improve When there was a survey, we were, oh, we don't want to do another survey. <laughs> we're like, that's going to be our session. Our session. Yeah. Thank you. But yes, thank you. I hope you all have a good afternoon. And if you have any other questions, I think we have our emails. Oh, yeah, the last slide has our emails on it. I'll wait till everybody's ready. Are we good? There's that one.